Um, so I just want to point out I'm, I'm primarily part of the Department of Genetics uh, and also uh, I became just last year also a member of the Brain Center. Uh, and these past days, two days, uh, have been a wonderful experience to be here in the Boca area and meet some of you uh, and to closely uh, meet the staff of the Hebrew University. It was uh, uh, an excellent time for me. So in the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about not really the work that we do, but m maybe more of an outlook for the future uh, and some of the things that we can do today with stem cells in neurodegenerative diseases. And when we talk about neurodegenerative diseases, we talk about diseases uh, of the nervous system, uh, primarily the central nervous system or the brain where cells die, um, most notably Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and I'll introduce you to another disease that we're working on, Huntington's disease. So just before I start, I want to introduce you to a, um, not a very famous uh, painter, and this is why I'm introducing him, but he, his name is Bill, Bill or William Uttermolen. He's a Dutch painter who uh, worked most of his uh, career in the UK. That's his self-portrait from the age of 34 in 1967. Let's go forward a few, few years. That's a self-portrait at the age of 64, 97, age 65, 98, self-portrait again, age 66, age 67. And you guessed right, he didn't completely change uh, radically his style. He just was inflicted with Alzheimer's disease and you can all, almost tell the year where the Simpsons started. Um, and in Alzheimer's, that's maybe one of the most renowned, prominent diseases, neurodegenerative diseases where brain in our cells die, we simply lose cells. So you can see a healthy brain and an Alzheimer's brain. So you can see the ventricles are bigger, there's, there's less material, uh, cortical tissue is damaged, uh, cholinergic cells are dying, and, and uh, other brain regions such as striatum and things like that. So, so basically these neurons, um, these neurons are responsible for, for cognition, for memory, and, and there is a deterioration process um, which will lose that. So how can stem cells help? So of course the first thing that comes to mind is that maybe we can use stem cells to replenish the dying tissue. Not so much. Not at this point and not in the near future. Um, I'm not saying it's not going to come, but it's not probably for brain disorders. There are simpler tissues, luckily, in our body. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm involved in one of these uh, projects. Um, uh, thanks to Arthur Guterman, a kidney. I'll maybe show a slide if I have time. Um, that maybe can be replenished with stem cells, but I don't think the brain is around the corner in that realm. However, it has been shown, for example, that stem cells transplanted into the brains of Parkinson's patients have acted as biological pumps. They produce dopamine in the brain, alleviating the symptoms of the patient. So even if you're not replenishing the dying uh, tissue altogether, these cells can still be useful uh, for some of these conditions. But maybe the, the most two significant things nowadays, today, in our current research in my lab and other labs around the world, is to use stem cells to model disease in the dish. And once you have this disease model, you can basically screen drugs. And, and uh, th this is very, very important because we have no access to brain material. It, it has been uh, completely inaccessible to research for many, many years. We, we had to use animals, you know, mostly mice, which they don't develop Alzheimer's, and, and they don't live for, for 80, 90 years, and they have a completely different sets of, of diseases. Um, even if you have those rare cases where you have brain a, a biopsy from, from autopsy or even from, from a living person, these neurons do not divide. So we don't have human brain tissue to work on. 
stem cells provide this rare tissue for us. So we can now take embryonic stem cells or what we call pluripotent stem cells, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it, um, differentiate these cells into neurons and generate human relevant disease models. So what are embryonic stem cells? We talk about embryonic stem cells, but, but uh, I think especially in this country where there's a lot of uh, uh, opposition to embryonic stem cell research, I don't think people actually understand what, what they really are. Embryonic stem cells are derived from the very early stage embryo. In fact, day five after fertilization in humans. This is a, a ball of cells, maybe 100 cells, that you can't see. Okay, it's not an embryo, by all means. It's a very, 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 very small uh, ball of cells that you can't see without a microscope. It's just a few days after fertilization, undergoing uh, several cell divisions. And this is how it looks like. It's the first time that we have basically two layers of cells. The outer cells, called uh, what is going to become the placenta, and the inner cells, which we call the inner cell mass, that is going to become the embryo. So if you take these inner cells and you culture them, you will have what we call embryonic stem cells. Now, people undergo in vitro fertilization all the time, you know, when they can't have babies, and these couples, they sometimes have 20, 30 embryos frozen down. They use some of them. They're transplanted back into the mother. But there are often 12, 15 embryos that are frozen. In this country, the option of freezing them forever or eventually, um, uh, I guess, destroying them is, seems better than uh, giving them for research. But I'm not going to go into the ethics or the uh, political side of stem cells. So the nice thing about embryonic stem cells is, is once you are able to culture them, they mimic very nicely the early stages of, of development. So you can actually generate these nice so-called embryoid bodies, uh, which really mimic the early stages of, of human embryonic development, again, something we had not access uh, to until now. And also, they are what we call pluripotent. They are almighty. They can generate all the cell types as if they were in vitro. That's what they're doing anyway. They're developing into all the cell types uh, in the mother. So in the dish, they maintain this capacity. So basically, they can, if we know how to do that, they can make blood and fat and neurons and, and macrophages, muscle, you name it. So we just. We need to know how, and this is the million dollar question. There are cookbooks coming out, week in, week out, how to make a fat cell, how to make a neuron, how to make a muscle. You know, by and large, it doesn't work, but we're getting there. So, so the know-how to, to generate these tissues is really the, the central um, uh, mechanism in, in underlying this research. Um, here's an example from my lab, how, how we make neurons. So here you can see embryonic stem cell colonies. Uh, this is a colony, here's a colony, another colony, and you can see they're grown on top of this rug or mat of support cells. These, these cells are very spoiled. They need another cells to secrete goodies for them to grow. So we grow them on these support cells, and then once you take the mat underneath them, they start to differentiate, they start to make these embryoid bodies like I showed you earlier, and then you can reculture these embryoid bodies and you can see, uh, start to see neurons emanating away. Uh, of course, you need to add all the uh, specific factors for neuronal development and neuronal differentiation. And here you can see a nice, relatively homogeneous culture of neurons in a dish. Um, we can also, is it possible to play that movie? Um, I just, I don't have a mouse. Is it possible to play the movie? There's a movie. So we can track, thank you. So we can track neurons under uh, a microscope. And here you can see a, an example of this. And this neuron will start projecting another, uh, uh, another uh, projection to, a, to another neuron. So, so we can really study them. Uh, another example is, uh, muscle development. So, and again, if you can play the, this movie, this is something that the cells do spontaneously. If you give them uh, the, the right conditions, they can start to form these beating foci. So just, just click on it, it'll start. Um, 
Yeah, so you can see like these beating hearts in a dish, spontaneous beating of, of heart tissue. Um, it takes 10 days to generate these beating uh, bodies. It's very effective. Um, but it turns out there's another way of generating pluripotent stem cells or embryonic-like stem cells. Instead of taking embryos, we can actually nowadays take mature cells and reprogram them to become embryonic-like stem cells, pluripotent stem cells. So this, is, uh, th this ingenious technology was developed less than 10 years ago by a Japanese researcher, already got the Nobel Prize two years ago for this. This is changing the, the world of research, of world of medicine. The, the first clinical trials just taking place in Japan, I think it's too early, but I'm just mentioning that. Uh, so it, and, and it turns out it's very simple. We can just take these three or four proteins. I can take a simple skin biopsy from any one of you, or even pluck a hair, take the cells from, from the root of the hair, stick in these four proteins, and in a matter of two to three weeks, generate these almighty stem cells. So this is very efficient, very effective, and it's really changing how, how we can do that. So basically, any skin biopsy, can be used. This is now commonly used in, in uh, medical centers around the world. We can take these three, four factors and generate stem cells. And now we can take these stem cells and generate whatever we want. Um, so one example from my lab, we're working on Huntington's disease. And the reason we didn't start with complex diseases such as Alzheimer or um, Parkinson's, which we really want to go to in the future, was they're just too complex. We, we wanted to start with something with a genetic basis. There's a very strong, in fact, 100% genetic basis to Huntington's disease. The gene has been recognized. If you carry this mutation, you will become sick, 100%, uh, you know, if you don't die from car accident or something. Um, but this is, uh, the penetrance is 100%. So we have uh, cells that we received from Huntington's disease patients. And, and just by the way, Huntington's disease manifests at, at quite similarly to other neurodegenerative diseases where certain uh, cells in our brain die. In this, uh, in this case, in the striatum. Uh, and it's mostly uh, motor neurons. So uh, the first symptoms are actually uh, involuntary movement, uh, hard to walk, things like that. Um, uh, but eventually cognitive and death. So here you can see the stem cell colonies. Uh, and we also have human embryonic stem cells derived from embryos of, uh, that carry the mutation. So we have both systems at the same time. So I think this is also very powerful. And we can generate neurons from these stem cells. And not only that, we can generate the correct type of neuron that is affected in the disease. So, so now we can, we can really, we, we have a disease model in the dish where we can start studying, exploring, and, and finding the, the biology, and of course, maybe doing drug screens and things like that. Um, another thing that this is really a few months old, um, came out from the, from the lab of Knobler, so I'm just citing someone else. There is a way nowadays, and we've reproduced it, to generate mini brains, brain organoids. So uh, this is a cerebral tissue generated in, the, in, in, in a lab. It's, it's about half a millimeter big, big, but it's got all the layered structure of a real brain. It's, it's really um, very impressive. Um, so just to end, the one of the major problems is neurodegenerative are late onset. They sometimes start at the age of 70 or 60 or 50. How come we can actually generate models in a dish in, in a couple of months? So to accelerate the aging process, we actually used um, a protein that uh, causes a dominant mutation that causes premature aging. It's a, it's a terrible disease called progeria. The lifespans of these kids is 12 to 15 years, and, and they look very old already at the age of seven or eight. It's terrible. But the, the gene, the protein responsible for the disease has been identified, and when you express it inside 
cells, you can expedite their aging process. So we've done it, and here you can see the healthy cells, here you can see cells expressing this progerin, and we did that actually with our Huntington neurons, and now we have aged Huntington neurons where we can screen drugs. This is just a, a, a slide from, from a, a, a first drug screen that we've done, and we have some compounds that we believe uh, will, will be able, will be tested in the near future. So with this, I'll end. I just want to, uh, uh, one last slide uh, for Arthur. He's, he's uh, supported something that otherwise we would not have done in, in my lab. And I, this is something that, that you know, is very dear to me, uh, uh, kidney. So kidney stem cells, there is no such field as kidney stem cells because the stem cells from the kidney were, were not really have been identified. And our goal was to generate kidney stem cells where we would be able uh, to make different types of kidney cells from stem cells. So together uh, with Professor Benny Dekel in uh, Sheba Medical School, uh, we did reprogramming of kidney cells to kidney stem cells uh, using one of those factors I mentioned. And actually, uh, they, these cells can proliferate and, and recently, we also show that they can actually make kidney structures in vivo in, in an animal model. Uh, so again, uh, this work could not have been achieved without members of my lab, uh, without uh, support. And thank you very much. And of course, I'll be happy to take questions.